Welcome everyone. I'm Shah. This is the Data Entrepreneurs. We are a community for people interested in pursuing ventures around AI or other data related technologies. Super excited for today's workshop because Amir is here and he's going to be talking about something that I'm sure a lot of people are excited about or even actively working on, which is AI product development with large language models. Just to give a little backstory, uh, I connected with Amir like back in August through his community, Aggregate Intellect, which is fantastic if you guys aren't familiar with it. I assume many have heard of it, but if you're not familiar, make sure you check that out. I learned a lot from at one of their sessions. And I've learned a lot from Amir personally. We've kind of connected offline and he's kind of been a really good mentor to me. So I'm excited for him to come on and share his insights and experience with you all. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Amir. Thanks, Sean, for having me. Hope you all are excited. I know it's Friday afternoon for a lot of you. So what I'm gonna do is that as we go forward, um, I'm gonna ask you to write things in the chat occasionally. That is mostly to make sure you're still awake. It's a relatively new and, you know, maybe advanced topic for in, in some places. Hopefully I'll try to simplify as much as I can. But the questions that I will ask is to make sure you're still with me uh, as we go. So I do a lot of jogging as part of my routine every day. And Shaw was asking me how many of my ideas come from those types of activities. It's you know, honestly a lot of them. And you know, I'm sure it has happened to you that you're doing something else other than working and an idea occurs to you, a solution to a problem. It could be while you're jogging, while you're showering, while you're cooking. Usually, interestingly, while you're doing some physical activity, all of a sudden, a solution to a problem that you were trying to solve comes to you and you're like, can I do this? The challenge is, uh, exploring ideas is usually problematic because you have to go through many steps. So normally you have to sort of figure out what is the task at hand, how you're going to go about exploring that idea. You have to come up with which part of the, the tasks that you thought about you should tackle first, gather information, reflect, hydrate, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are usually a bunch of steps that you have to go through to understand if an idea is worth pursuing. So the problem is if you're running, if you're cooking, if you're taking a shower, usually you have to wait until that activity is over before you can explore it. And that's not ideal, is it? Because by the time you got home, you're less excited, you might have forgotten it, etc., etc. So the problem is there are too many steps involved, there are too many different tools potentially involved in, in this process of exploring an idea that has occurred to you. Um, so it might be difficult to jump on all interesting ideas that you have. And I say part of this problem is also the user experience of the products that we use to explore information. So a lot of the products we use are, you know, what we call digital products. Uh, and I'm calling it classical because, you know, as you expect, I'm going to compare it to LLM products. But, you know, they usually, I guess you don't have to read all the, all the words. There are a lot of details. But the, the, the long story short is that their user experience is very rigid. So you have to go open a browser, open a thing, type the information, click on menus, do a bunch of back and forth until you find a piece of information that is useful to you, right? So that that's the... That's the user experience, the di digital user experience that we are we have been used to and love. But you know, as we all have seen over the past fifteen months or so, uh, maybe slightly more, almost eighteen months now, there are a lot of products that are coming up that are LLM powered, uh, and they provide slightly more um, fluid, if you wish, user experience where you can just talk to them, they can talk back, and you can do this back and forth. But the part that becomes interesting about these products is that how you handle error in them and how feedback is collected and integrated into product becomes very different um, and importantly these are fairly unpredictable models so even getting the system to behave in a robust way is very difficult so that that's partly why we haven't seen you know these products taking over the world and you know come well, they, they are taking over the world, but you know, at, at a rate that could have been much larger if you're not facing these kind of problems that I'm highlighting here. So on a very high level, yes, the LLM-based products might be a solution to the type of problem that I brought up, but there are some significant 
hurdles along the way uh, as we as we figure things out and go forward. So I want to give you a bit of a history uh, about myself and why I'm here talking to you about these things today. Uh, so I'm a physicist by training. Uh, I did my PhD at University of Toronto. Uh, then I worked as a researcher at University of Oxford. Uh, my area of expertise used to be two lives ago, uh, used to be quantum computing. And after that, I came back to Canada and started working as a, as a data scientist, largely focusing on natural language processing. Um, and I built a bunch of you know, document processing AI type of products at Royal Bank. Um, and in 2018, because I was, this has been recorded, I probably shouldn't say it loud, but I was pretty bored at my corporate job. So I started building the community that later became ACE Community as Trusted. Um, and you know, today we have more than 5,000 AI researchers and engineers in our global community. Um, and you know, there is a Slack workspace where we hang out, uh, and Shaw will share that link with you later. Uh, but right after that, in 2019, I started a company, Hagrid Intellect, uh, and you know, some of the folks on this call might have been with us for many, many years. Since then, uh, Hagrid Intellect originally had the uh, sort of the tagline of redefining scientific discovery. So, you know, notice that this is very shortly after I had left academia. So I had this idea that AI can come in and completely change scientific discovery. And I still think that that's true, but uh, unfortunately, very quickly, I learned that nobody's going to pay me to do that. So, um, so I had to explore other ideas as a business. So. Uh, the very first thing that we seriously launched as a business at Aggregate Intellect was an educational platform. We started publishing a lot of uh, premium content and subscription service and things like that. But because of a number of reasons, we ended up shutting that down, um, mostly because people started asking for certificates. And out of principle, I didn't like that. Uh, so the next idea that we tried was an R&D marketplace. We would go to a startup, say, what are your R&D problems? We set up a competition in our community, and if anybody builds anything interesting, you can acquire their IP, and um, and we'll just take a cut. Beautiful idea, very difficult to pull off as a business. Again, we tried this for a while, and then ended up shutting it down. But what we learned was that interacting with knowledge was very difficult for a lot of people who were participating in our competitions. You have like a zillion papers, you have a bunch of blog posts, a lot of code. Interacting with these as you build things was very difficult. So we thought, what if we made this visual? What if we used AI to extract knowledge and visualize it like literally like Google Map, where you can go and sort of walk around on your knowledge, right? And that's a product we were building. We thought that we would launch it as a SaaS product. Um, but, you know, fast forward to today, uh, what we're building is a human machine, human interface. So sort of a system that does what I described, but in a much more sophisticated way. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the turning point was, you know, as you can imagine, chat GPT came out. So speaking of elephant in the room, um, I would like to pause, and this is one of those steps where I stop talking for like a minute and you type in the chat, you know, a few phrases about what comes to mind when you think chat GPT. It's your turn. Go on. I'm going to have my tea while you type. <clears throat> Open AI product pre-release wonder speech writer okay grammar correction true i use it for that all the time promising but hallucinations helps me code automation email drafts organize ideas google search replacer prototype for ai 
All right, keep it coming. Keep it coming. Um, so as I was preparing the slides, these are the things that came to mind. It hallucinates. It's not connected to knowledge sources. Although with ChatGPT Plus that has changed, but um, I can collaborate with others. Uh, information is very generic usually. Uh, like you see a piece of text on social media and you're like, ah, naughty, you use ChatGPT to write a social post. Um, and it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really reason, you know, that, that's why it gets things wrong. Um, and the reason that these things are happening is that, especially the hallucination problem and robustness problems, is that language models, uh, like ChatGPT is just a UI in front of a language model, with a bit of bells and whistles, obviously, but ultimately it, it's, a, it's a language model, which, which means that it can only do linguistic tasks very well. Uh, so that, and, and you know, all of a sudden people are like, oh, why can it do, why can it not do all of these other things? So, uh, and that's a very important point that we are going to, uh, you know, keep coming back to as we go forward. Uh, so sort of, um, I want to talk about uh, the evolution of LLM products as I've observed them over the past, um, you know, many months, uh, 18 months or so. Uh, I know I'm bashing ChatGPT to, to some extent, but one of the remarkable things that ChatGPT did, and I think a few people in the chat also mentioned that, was that ChatGPT made a very remarkable product choice, which means that instead of what was available in the past few months before that, which was just a model available through APIs to nerds like you and I, all of a sudden ChatGPT said, what if you wrap this as a chat interface? Wouldn't that be cool? And that was part of the reason that it just took off so well, because any random grandma from the street could now interact with AI. So sort of like, you know, again, like if you really abstract things away, ultimately it is a UI in front of a large language model. Very quickly, we realized the limitations of that. Uh, or you know maybe people in research knew already, and we're working on systems to replace that. And we came up with this idea of what if we separate the language model and the data sources, and that's what we call RAG, retrieval augmented generation. And I call it baby RAG, because <laughs> that's the thing that you usually start from. You know, like uh, a lot of ChatGPT Plus uh, plugins actually have something like this where. The data is separated, but it is feeding into LLM, and then the LLM provides the answers through a UI. Right? Uh, but if you want to do write properly, uh, normally you need to, um, you know, throw in a working memory to keep track of things um, properly. Have you know, give it long-term memory, uh, but also because you have separated the data layer and the interface, which is the linguistic interface and the user interface you get to throw in a bunch of interesting things that control the behavior of the system. Like you could control who can, like the person that is asking questions, what data do they have access to, and you just fetch information from that data, right? So, or you could do a lot of other things to guardrail the behavior of the system. So this is what I call proper, right? Because, you know, you're not just throwing a UI in front of LLM connected to the database and say, hey, do things you're actually thinking about the software components of this product that you're offering. And then uh, the buzzword of the day, agents, is pretty much similar to what uh, a RAG structure would be, except that you also add other software components to the system or modules that uh, allow you to do tool use. And I will describe this a little more later and planning so if if you add these kind of capabilities uh to to your system then all of a sudden you have what we can call uh, an agent and the reason that uh we call them agent is that they have agency which means that they can choose uh how to plan a task and what tools to use to execute it and if you put a face on it it becomes a cute agent with you know, arms and legs and everything. So um, now 
The other buzzword of the day is multi-agent systems. Uh, what I like to think about more than just multi-agent systems is multi-agent, multiplayer systems, because unlike many people, I have less ambitions around automation. Um, a lot of people are like, let's automate everything. And you know, that's first of all, not realistic. So, second of all, not really uh, responsible. So what I'm very interested in and next generation of products that hopefully will start coming out, and that's what we're working on as well, is systems where add what we were talking about, like agents, but add a knowledge sharing uh, mechanism as well as work orchestration mechanism and put that in the middle of a bunch of machine agents like agent one and two here, as well as human agents like Jane and John and allow this system, this multiplayer, which are humans and multi-agent, which are uh, LLMs, to collaborate, coordinate, and do work together. So these are sort of the next generation of very interesting products that will come out. I will tell you a little more about how we're building this in Sherpa, uh, but this is sort of the evolution of what has happened in the past 18 months. So a uh, word, a phrase that I'm trying to spin and you know, get people to use it more is knowledge ops. Uh, knowledge ops is sort of inspired from DevOps, ML ops, data ops, all of the things ops uh, that we've been throwing around in the past decade or so. Um, and the core idea of it is that, you know, very much like we have been operationalizing all things like development, machine learning, modeling, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now we are at a point where we have a strong enough tools that we can start thinking about operationalizing our knowledge. And a lot of you know the workflow that I showed at the beginning and a lot of what the LLMs are doing is actually getting to this realm of you know giving us automation or at least significant augmentation in how we interact with our knowledge. So I think knowledge ops is an, is an appropriate term describing what is coming next. Um, so the capability that we need for knowledge ops is, in my opinion, language skills reasoning skills and the ability to use tools and these are also partly uh you know the components the ingredients needed for what we call agents uh, so we need language skills because we want them to understand language and it's not only natural language we want them to also understand formal language like code we want them to generate language again both natural and formal language and we want them to inference uh, infer about language so if we give it a bunch of text, it can infer things about it for us. Um, we want it to have reasoning skill. So we want the language skills because that's what we use humans. Uh, and if the machine is doing something and we want to ask it, hey, what are you up to? It should be able to tell us what, what it is doing. Or we should be able to give it instructions, commands, and again, for it to tell us the results of something it is doing for us. And then we need it to have reasoning skills, like it has to be able to grab uh, a task, a, a complex task, and break it down into subtasks and composition, uh, uh, and decompose it into subtasks. And it then has to be able to plan it, which means that which one should be done first, with what type of dependencies, and in what order, uh, and using what tools, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And eventually, it has to be able to use tools uh, for the purposes of this conversation, we are going to limit everything to software products, which means that uh, normally tool usage will be available through writing code. And code could be just writing, I don't know, a JSON object that is sent to an API, or it could be literal code, like writing Python code to do math. Uh, but then that could go to many, many different types of tools, you know, hundreds of different tools. Uh, and they can do all types of things. They can generate audio, they can analyze audio, they can analyze video, they can do math, et cetera, et cetera, all of the good things that you have seen. And ideally, for knowledge ops, for you know, sort of the agent-based uh, scenarios that we talked about, um, you, you put all of these together in a smart way to create a product that actually solves the problem for the customer uh, or the end user. Um, so, if we go back to where we started, we were talking about, um, you know, you're out on a jog, an idea occurs to you, 
and you want to you want to have a product ideally that you just talk to and say hey whatever is the name of the assistant sherpa um, i have this idea can you put together a five page report a five page technical report about it by the time i get home right and it can occasionally even ask you questions because remember you were talking about we want this to be multiplayer uh, and it you know starts going through all of the steps that we talked about uh, for example it uses its language and reasoning skills to come up with the tasks and you know their, their ordering uh, it can use tools to call all the places where the information might live and get get that information it can reflect on the performance of the information that it has gotten either ask me for some more feedback or you know come up with the next thing that needs to be done and keep repeating and hopefully by the time i get home i have a very nice report i can read uh, or i might just say hey give me the take at least you know so but you know this is this is the type of product we are going towards um going forward um and you know um there are already toy examples of these kind of systems uh, a16z put out um, just a while ago i think this is an old example i should find a newer one uh, but you know that that gives you the idea that essentially they use the video game engine and use the types of ideas that i'm talking about and the system just you know played against itself um so what we are really talking about here is uh automating a lot of workflows so essentially products that we are building that are automating a lot of workflows that we are used to to do in very manual and painful ways by going to six different apps doing a bunch of different steps in them etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and i don't want to go through I, i'm going to show you a table and i don't want to go through it because we don't have a lot of time we can come back to it if anybody has a question and hopefully you can see this slide later but um, you know what i'm trying to do here is to say uh, yes, we are trying to do this, but we are still far from complete autonomy uh, in these types of systems because of a lot of infrastructure type of problems. And the comparison that I'm making is with another product, which are autonomous vehicles, right? We, we've been trying to get to, uh, you know, full autonomy in them for years. And arguably that's a slightly more limited in terms of a scope type of product that we are building there. Uh, but even that is taking a lot of time and we can start you know to see the challenges that a product like that might face uh by just doing a side by side comparison that you know avs were here and that's what they faced and that's where we are so sort of again like i'm not going to go through this but essentially my argument is that you're probably at level three autonomy or, or at the beginning of level three autonomy in uh, in multi-agent systems and LM type of products uh, that are trying to do workflow augmentation. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting parallels that can be drawn, but really to get uh, to, the, to the highest levels of autonomy, we need to start thinking a lot more about uh, not only what products we are building, but also what kind of context are these products sitting in. Maybe we need to change our corporate structures, definition of work, and all of those good things for these things to happen. Very much like on the autonomous vehicle side, we need to rethink how our cities are built, uh, how our roads are created and you know connected with each other. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of interesting infrastructure questions have to be asked and answered. Uh, but you know, the point is we're building a lot of cool things. We are at the beginning of a very exciting time in terms of the type of products that will be built and you know we'll see where it goes uh, but just to summarize you know and hopefully give you something to take away from the last slide there was a lot of information but essentially i think we're at the beginning of this level three autonomy in LLM systems and the goal is to create oracles that connect to a lot of systems that we use and these oracles would increase the effectiveness of how we work and if we can really achieve that, then I think, uh, you know, we have a lot of interesting products in our hands. Uh, and with that, I promise to also use Sherpa as an example of uh, a system that is trying to do something like this. And I want to share some of the uh, learnings that 
we gained as we go, we went through it. Sherpa, for those who are not familiar, is our is, is the product we're working on. It is available as a Python library, but it is also available as a uh, Slack bot in that link that Shaw put in the chat, um, where you can interact with it. Uh, we we position it as an AI augmented uh, thinking companion, and currently on the commercial side, we are customizing that for a few customers. Uh, but the core idea of it is, you know, what I described before, which is that multi-agent, multiplayer scenario, where uh, John would come in and ask a question from the system. The system will use that multi-agent scenario to come up with a plan of how we want to solve this problem. Then a critic would give feedback to it. Then the system starts using different types of agents, like researchers who have access to a set of tools to solve that problem. Uh, and you know, he might even call other types of agents with other set of tools. Um, and you know, the critic is constantly verifying the information to to avoid having uh, any sort of compounding error in the system, right? And, and that's a very interesting topic that we can get into some details. Um, and yes, John is everywhere. Um, and and you know, the, the very important thing that I want to highlight is that. Um, we we want Sherpa, and I think most uh, products like this should be uh, human and expert in the loop in a sense that they should not just try to do things on their own because they might hallucinate, they might come up with uh, incorrect information, and that error can compound and just hurt the whole workflow very quickly. So there has to be, like again, think about the level three autonomy in vehicles where the operator has to be in a car and in charge of things. Um, so that that's sort of um, you know the big picture I think that you can have here. So I want to finish with my commandments for you. Uh, I talked about a lot of things on a very high level, and you know hopefully we can go back to them and discuss them in more detail. Uh, if there are any questions, and please put your questions in the chat, uh, or you can raise your hand after. But here are my five commandments if you're building LLM products. Commandment number one, thou shalt not count on LLMs beyond linguistic interfaces. I work with a lot of clients who come to me and say, oh, you know, you're trying to do this LLM to do this sophisticated thing and it is hallucinating. And I'm like, of course, you know, it is a linguistic interface. Why do you expect it to do all these complex reasonings and data handling, right? So you like really, taking a step back and just putting it in the box that it is, is going to be very helpful when you're designing products. And of course, you know, you might argue that, oh, LLMs are getting better and blah, 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 and GPT-4 have has all these extra capabilities, etc. I'm very happy for you, but the reality is that we are building with these models today and we want to have products that you know, help people today, you're not talking about what will happen in three years. So the reality of today is that they're linguistic interfaces. Let's design it, design our products with that acknowledgement, right? The second thing is, and I think this is very important, um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess those of you who are familiar with RAG, you probably practice this every day where, I think the interface and the data layers should be completely separate from each other because that gives you a lot of control uh, that you need um, in a product like this. Uh, and a lot of problems that I see people have a hard time wrapping their head around. You know, for example, sometimes people ask, oh, how do I make sure the LLM doesn't have access to the information that this, I don't know, user employee shouldn't shouldn't be able to access? And you know my response is you're at, you're asking the wrong question because what you really have to do is to separate the data layer, put in the right controls on the data layer, and then the LLM gets added just as an interface, right? Um, the next thing is that the fact that you're using an LLM doesn't give you a free pass to skip all the software engineering steps. Uh, again, you know some of our community members and myself have been having. Um, a lot of venting sessions around this topic that a lot of people are thinking that, oh, we just throw in an LLM, throw in a database, vector database, and slap on a UI and we have a product. 
the reality is you do not. You have like a science fair thing, and that's cute, but to make it a product, you have to think about all of the software aspects. And actually, a lot of the things that actually make the proper RAG system, as I put it, uh, a very strong candidate for a lot of scenarios that people are dealing with and trying to solve is the fact that um, you know, you're really going back to all the software modularity and components that are needed for a system to behave in a robust way and having all the necessary tests in place and, and all of those good things to really make sure that you have a software system that behaves well. And that, that's going to significantly reduce the hallucinations, significantly reduce the, um, you know, uh, reduce the lack of predictability uh, and all of those. Well, I won't say good things, but bad things. Um, if you're a product person in the audience, um, you cannot write at the bottom of your product that, hey, just be aware that this product might occasionally hallucinate and give you incorrect information. That's, I think, a product person. Sin, a person that does that, designs a product like that, should be punished, in my opinion. If a product harms somebody and you're the product owner of that product, you're responsible. So you have to, and you cannot say, oh, we'll wait until the LLMs are better. The LLMs are what they are today. So you have to think about everything that you're pulling into your product, including LLMs, with the acknowledgement of the shortcomings that they have and then design around those shortcomings. Like the fact that they hallucinate should be something that is up forefront of mind and then design around the fact that it does hallucinate so you know create anything that is necessary like verifications guardrails and all of those good things uh, to reduce the harm as much as possible you can probably not make it zero but you know you're responsible to minimize it as much as possible and finally uh, you know as i said you have to test, evaluate, verify, and repeat, because if your software harms somebody, it is on you as the product person. So that was a bit of a negative <laughs> spin to end this on, but hopefully this was helpful. I have to go back into any of the details. There is like so much you know, technical and product and business details that I left out in favor of time, but I want to finish here and um, Please connect with me on LinkedIn if you're not connected already. And on LinkedIn, there's a link to my calendar where you can book me and talk about any of the above. So if you don't get to interact today, feel free to do that and we'll interact later. And with that, I'll throw it back to Sean. Well, let's thank Amir for a super insightful session. I got a ton of notes here, but let's open it up for Q&A. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, or go ahead and raise your hand. All right, we got one that came through. Is it reasonable to evaluate the FM we use for the product with a smarter LLM in order to evaluate the systems? Sorry, I don't know what FM is. Yeah, um, uh, Milad, could you clarify what FM is? Okay, foundation model. Reasonable <laughs> to evaluate the foundation model we use for the product with a smarter LLM in order to evaluate the system. If I understand the question correctly, you're saying GPT-4 is too expensive. Can I evaluate it with a tiny llama and then use that to decide if the system is working? I think that's what you're asking. Nobody stops you from doing that. So that, that could be one of the things that you do. But ultimately, uh, you know, testing your system as is and as it will be interfaced by the customer is going to be very important. Uh, so yes, this could be one of the tests you do, uh, one of the evaluations you do, but you cannot skip you know, evaluating the system in production, for example, right? So if the system in pro production is you know, using GPT-4, uh, then that's what you have to test. Um, and it's also important to remember that the prompting for these different models is slightly different. Um, so if it works with I don't know, Llama in your dev environment, and then your um, uh, production environment is using GPT-4, and you're keeping the same prompts, you're probably not going to get the same type of performance. So um, I think what you need to really take a step back and think about is uh, how can you decompose what the system needs to do into smaller modules, and what kind of models each of those modules need 
and just test those modules one at a time and then test the integration of those mod modules and then the system level testing. So you have to do all of these or at least as much of those as possible uh, within uh, within reason, obviously, right? Like you don't want to, uh, you know, rack up a bunch of uh, GPT-4 bill cost as well. So. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, any other questions? Feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand. I'll I'll go ahead and uh, and drop one. So how you're laying out like the five levels of automation and like a lot of this was just like a very compelling vision of like where everything is going. And so you were talking about that we have to rethink things in order to get to this level five. And so I guess this is kind of like an impossible question at this point, but where should we start? Like what assumptions do we need to be reevaluating? What what do we need to be rethinking at this point? It's funny you you asked that. We we have this Friday sessions, we call it problem solvers. Uh, and uh, somebody was presenting this very complex sales process. And he was suggesting a few different points during that process where LLMs can come in and make a difference, right? And the question I asked there was, okay, it sounds like you're saying you want to introduce a bunch of point solutions, but why not just go for like a unified fabric that just integrates into everything and just, because in principle, the whole sales process, for example, is using the same type of documents and information and data points as CRM data, blah, blah, and uses all of these to uh, essentially write proposals or interact with customer, et cetera, et cetera. So why not like a, a central brain with a bunch of tentacles into mm -hmm. And, you know, his answer was, first of all, no, no buyer is going to pay for that because they're like, oh my God, like you're, you're telling me to change this whole machine that I've been perfecting over the past 10 mm -hmm. years, right? So that like just the, the stakeholder pushback uh, is going to be one part of it. The other part of it is just the cost and, you know, finding somebody who's willing to let you, you know, uh, somebody who's willing to be the guinea pig. Yeah. You know, because this is not going to be a straightforward. You have to just burn a lot of things to ground and rebuild it from mm -hmm. scratch, etc. So, um, so a lot of infrastructure needs to change. And I really, really deeply love this analogy with autonomous vehicles because that's exactly the same there. Like infrastructure has to change there mm. for us to like if you know 50% of cars are AVs and the rest are manual, we're still not getting the value we want because you know the, the crazy you know human driver might just do random things and just mess up everything, right? So uh, really to get to that level of autonomy, a lot of things have to change from the very, very fundamental. Like even you know, a lot of I spend a lot of time thinking about future work. And the reason is the way we think about work, the way we think about corporate structures and things like that, in my opinion, has to significantly change. Because the way work is structured now with a lot of layers of middle managers and executives and then, you know, soldiers on the ground, uh, that's not be that's not gonna, you know, stick around for too much longer because you know, middle managers do a lot of things that LLMs will become very good at doing in the next five years or so. And if that happens, what what, what does it mean to have a corporate anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, onboarding and offboarding employees becomes a lot more streamlined going forward. So what does it even mean to belong to a particular company, right? So a lot of these types of questions, I think, will be, uh, a lot of things that we take for granted have to be questioned again and yeah. go back to drawing board and say, where is the green field? And, and actually, one of the things that we discussed earlier was that it's a bit of a counterintuitive thing, but if you want to bring something like this to life, you almost have to go somewhere that is, from a technology point of view, pretty far back. Because if they're like halfway there, they're going to be like, oh, we have all of these ERPs and CRMs and email, whatever, implemented. Uh, you know, you're not going to replace all of them. But somebody who's really far back but has a lot of momentum and enthusiasm is the perfect mm. place to play with this because there will be very good guinea pigs, but also they have the momentum and enthusiasm to try it. 
and also they're starting from the drawing board. They're like, okay, what do we do with this? Uh, lot to think about. Uh, I'll probably be thinking about that all night. <laughs> uh, let's see, we got something in the chat, perhaps a uh, critique. <laughs> I was struck by your comment, it's your product, so if it causes harm, it's your responsibility. But if I accidentally cut myself with a sharp knife, I don't blame the manufacturer. <laughs> That's a very fair point. <laughs> um and i think i think you know a lot of people think that way i don't like i think um uh, i think even the knife manufacturer probably spends a lot of time thinking about how to reduce the accidental harm of their knife as much as possible right and that's what i'm talking about like i'm not saying that you could completely remove all possible harm if there is a malicious actor and comes in and says I'm going to use this, I don't know, baseball bat to kill people. Mm. They can, you know, like you cannot really fix the intention of bad, bad actors. <laughs> but, you know, as, as, a, as a, I don't know, manufacturer of cars that might be used to drive into populations and kill people or go from A to B for a, a nice vacation, Probably as the product person, as the manufacturer of that car, you spend a lot of time increasing the safety, increasing uh, the, the uh, decreasing the amount of harm that might happen in an accident and blah, 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 right? Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you have to do your part because if you don't and something bad happens and you could have prevented it, it is on you. Mm. Right? One thing from John, better comparison would be knife with secretly a gun. That, that's kind of funny. Uh, okay, we got another uh, comp question. Apart from hallucination, LLMs sometimes show a fair bit of inconsistency in the answers, correct but different, with the same simple prompt. LLM will produce a very different answer. Um, is that a real problem you have encountered? And if yes, what causes this and how to tackle that? LLMs ultimately are statistical machines. Um, and, you know, they, they are computing a bunch of statistics and based on that predict what the next likely sequence of tokens would be. So the fact that they are quote unquote inconsistent is, is not a bug. It's just the property of them. It, it's a feature they have. Uh, and, you know, when, when at the end I said, uh, you have to, you have to say, given that they do produce sequences inconsistently, how can I design my product to reduce the impact of that on, on the customer, right? So what you're describing is not necessarily a bad thing for creative use cases that's actually very desired. Like you want, you know, run A to run B, give you different things because you want to bring, brainstorm a bunch of ideas. Or for factual things, you want to reduce the inconsistency as much as possible, and you want to prompt it in a way that focuses on what you put in a context, for example, in a rag setup. So I think uh, I, I think there is a bit of an implicit uh, implication, I guess, in the question that this is necessarily bad. So first of all, it is not. It might be. It is a, first of all, it is a property. It might be desired or not, based on which scenario you are in. I don't know. You might reduce the temperature to make it more repeatable. You might increase it to make it more, uh, you know, valuable uh, if you're doing a creative task. Um, but also a lot of the system design that I talked about, you know, that separation of data layer can really help you because uh, if you create a really good retrieval system that fetches the right data, puts it in a context, and you play with a prompt so that you ensure that it reduces the likelihood of it just producing random things and just it uses to extract information from the retrieved context, etc. That that can really reduce the inconsistency. Um, so yes, it is a property of the system, but is it desired or not? And how you how are you going to act in each of those cases as specific? So that brings us to the end. We're kind of right up on time. Uh, if you guys have any other questions for Amir, you know, feel free to book time with him or to just reach out to him on LinkedIn. I'm sure he'll get your question answered. I'll also share his course in the uh, in the chat. And he's been generous enough to give a super discount for those who paid it in person. So. Uh, be sure to grab that if you're uh, trying to learn more about large language models. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining, thanking Amir once again for preparing this talk. 
Um, next week, we will have another LLM focused session where Jeremy, the CEO of NAS, will be talking about how you can build an AI assistant with NAS and Python. So be sure to register for that if that's interesting to you. And we'll also share the recording of this session on our YouTube channel. And if you registered for this event, you'll get a link to that after the call. Uh, so with that, I just wanted to thank you guys again for joining and we'll see you in the next one.